Hey, what's going on gamers? I figured I needed to do a quick update on my NES game progress. Since I haven't made any in a while, and I don't want to lose my habit of making videos, at least once in a month. As usual, you can grab the ROMs uh, from the links that are available in the video's description, and try the game for yourself. So, let's dive in and see what's new. I actually reorganized the cave and moved the niche with the skeleton to the right because if you actually read the letter it might seem strange that this guy could not get out of the cave but now i think it's more believable then i fixed the glitch where some random map columns would get messed up from time to time while fixing that i discovered that it was possible to get stuck inside obstacles if you would mash start button repeatedly so i had to fix that as well then I decided to finally implement fixed point numbers in my game. I think I definitely should have implemented them at the beginning of this project because now I admit it was much harder and took way more time. So you might ask what the heck are those fixed point numbers? I actually hadn't even heard about them myself until I saw some people mentioning them in the comments. Like, come on. What do you expect? I'm not some mathematician or a seasoned game dev industry veteran. So what's it all about? Well, if you are using the 6502 assembly, there's no way you could possibly utilize real numbers like 0.5 or 22.15 and so on. All you can have by default are 8-bit unsigned integers. So for example, your character speed could be 1, 2, 3 or more pixels per frame, let's say. But 2 pixels per frame is already very fast. What if I want to have something in between 1 and 2? Or what if I want my character to move slower than? one pixel per frame. What about the momentum? What if I want to increase the movement speed gradually? So obviously just the integer numbers are not enough. I need those fractions. You might think it's very difficult to implement that in assembly, right? Wrong. Surprisingly it's really not that hard, but you need to use a little bit more memory. So imagine you have an 8-bit number that is the X coordinate of your character. So you need to expand this variable by just one byte. You can still use this variable as before because the load instruction would load single byte anyway. But now this first byte would be the integer part of this variable. And the second byte would be the fractional part. If I want to just draw the character on the screen or test the collision, the integer part is enough, so I don't need to change anything. And that's great. The second byte comes into play when I want to move the character. As I mentioned, this byte is the fraction of the number. The fraction is expressed as an integer. So 1 stands for 1 being divided by 256. So the single step is roughly about 0 0.004 and 255 is obviously 255 divided by 256 so it's almost 1 but not quite. When I add or subtract these fixed point numbers, for instance when I add the movement speed to the x coordinate, first I do the operations with fractions and then I do the same operation with integer parts. But this time I don't call CLC or SEC instructions in order to leave the carry flag intact. Because if the fractional byte overflows, the CPU's carry flag would tell to the ADC or SBC instructions that the integer part also must be affected. So if we had the integer part as 0 and the fractional part as 255 
if we would add 1 to the fractional part, the integer part in this case should turn to 1. You can also think of this second byte as some kind of a delay counter. So basically we are incrementing or decrementing this counter before we do anything with the main number. I have definitely used this behavior before in this game. While it may seem that I'm making things more complex than necessary, this feature has opened up some new possibilities for me. For example, now I can set different speeds for the PAL and NTSC versions of my game. Previously the movement speed in the PAL version was a little bit slower, because as you know, the timing in NES games is tied to the refresh rate of the television standard of a particular region. In this case, the PAL region has 50 Hz refresh rate or 50 frames per second, while the NTSC is 1.2 times faster. What if I could just multiply the movement speed in the PAL version by 1.2? Sure, it's probably not the most accurate way to do it, but lo and behold, the characters now travel the same distance at the same time. Of course, the movement in the PAL version might not look as smooth, but it seems that the speed is almost the same. Also, you may recall that there was a problem with the diagonal movement. I have definitely gotten more than one comment saying that the character is moving much faster when moving diagonally. So what happens there? For example, if the X and Y coordinates are simultaneously incremented by the same speed, the character would actually travel a slightly greater distance than the speed. We can calculate this distance by using the Pythagorean theorem. So this diagonal distance is a square root of the speed squared and multiplied by 2. Let's say the speed is 1, so the diagonal distance would be about 1.4. So how do I fix this? Luckily, the fixed point numbers will help me to solve this problem as well. First, I need to determine if the character is moving diagonally. And when that happens, I need to change the speed of the character so that the diagonal distance would be equal to the amount of the regular movement speed. To find this new diagonal speed, we need to solve this equation. Sure, calculating this multiple times in real time on the NES would be too much for the CPU, so I pre-calculated all my diagonal speeds. So whenever I detect that my character or an animal is moving diagonally, I use my pre-calculated diagonal speed instead of a regular one. So the days when you could move lightning fast while zigzagging diagonally are finally over. And that's the fixed point numbers for you. They are actually quite useful. And now I feel somewhat dumb because I haven't considered using them before. So after I was done messing with the math, I decided to add an extra screen to the location where the granny's house was. And there I added an entrance to a new cave. It's a smallish cave that's completely dark, just like the cave that leads to the alien base. So if the player happens to find this cave first before the main one, he or she might want to return back after getting the lamp, just to check what this tiny cave might hide inside. I actually have put some goodies in there. After I added the third screen to the granny's location, I realized that my scrolling code was broken all this time. Only the first location where the player's house is could scroll normally. And that's because I forgot to write a proper addressing code for the map column data. I have no idea how the scrolling worked in the northern cave before. Of course I have fixed everything now, but I imagine if someone wanted to 
take my code in order to make a mod or completely new game by changing the content, I bet it would have been and probably still could be a nightmare for that person. As it usually happens, I ran out of free space in the main bank again. This time I only managed to free up a tiny bit and it was definitely not enough for the further development. The problem was that whenever I moved the code that was responsible for instance for the player's collision with the pickable items or code that checked if the player hits NPCs, I got these black bars on the screen while walking. That's probably the main reason why my code is mostly concentrated in the main bank. I just simply could not understand why these black bars appear and I was kinda lazy and reluctant to figure it out. At first I thought maybe the game runs slower when I add the bank switching code and it fails to calculate correct uh, map column index when the non-maskable interrupt is called. But then I put a bunch of NOPs in those subroutines instead of bank switching code in order to slow everything down. But then the black stripes did not appear. And then it hit me. Like, how could I be so stupid? The problem was that during the NMI, the game would read the map tile values from the ROM. And after I added bank switch to a certain parts of my code, it happened that the NMI would be called at the exact time the game switches to some different bank where the map tiles are not available. Obviously it would draw a black column because it can't find the map data. So to fix this issue I had to store the tile values of a particular map column in RAM and during the NMI I would read the data from the RAM instead of ROM. This made the map column update routine more complex, but it greatly simplified the code in the NMI. This is great because uh, the NMI has a limited amount of the CPU cycles, and if it runs for too long it might produce some glitches. So I'm pretty sure that's not gonna happen anymore. There was also a very similar issue with the NPC dialogues. I could notice that some letters occasionally disappearing from them. Well this time I reluctantly allocated whopping 96 bytes in RAM just to avoid this issue. Finally I can move out a huge chunks of code from the main bank and start adding some new features. One of those features is the checkpoint in the cave. I thought it would be really annoying to be killed by the boss and start everything all over. At first I revived the player only after losing to the boss. But when I tried to play the game this type of logic seemed weird and unfair. So instead of that I decided to resurrect the hero if he dies in the dark cave or the alien base. It doesn't matter who or what kills him. I should also mention that this checkpoint is not a legit save. I just mainly recorded the player's main stats and the content of the inventory. Actually, surprise surprise, I started running out of RAM and I simply can't waste my memory and store every state. Plus with the current mapper I use, I can't do proper saving anyway. So if you would reset your console, you would have to start the game from the beginning. Unfortunately, that's all the changes for now. I hope next time I will have more things to show. So if you're interested, then please subscribe the channel. So thanks for watching till the end and I will see you in the next video. Bye.